Hey everyone, I'm Rachel. And I'm Jen, and welcome to Devilish Bookworms, the podcast. Where we read and review books and release episodes every Tuesday. This week we have The Hollows by C.L. Monaghan. Yay! This is actually set in London, and it starts in 1835. Now, I love this. So you, you picture your dark, dreary night, get all the feels of London. All right. A boy is actually coming into the world on this eve. While this is happening, there is also a solar eclipse and Halley's Comet is actually coming through Earth's atmosphere. There's a lot going on. There is a lot going on. And you know what? This is great for this because all of the circumstances of his birth, he actually is born with supernatural abilities to control not only the light but he can also control the darkness which fucking rad okay i'm sorry side note here if i was born during those circumstances and had those abilities i'd be so stoked so fucking stoked yeah i'd have to agree i mean well i mean i guess it's one of those things i wish i had curly hair i wish i had straight hair you know yeah so it's so cool though like i want powers you're so cool oh whatever (laughs) so as we were saying because of his circumstances he was born with the the ability to control light and dark so with these abilities he uses them to solve crimes around london he's actually not quite a detective but a private consultant So he does go around helping solve crimes and this is actually going to be very interesting because he's going to help solve the mystery of a string of victims being left behind. Not exactly dead, but they're barely alive. And the inspector actually says they would have been better off being dead. Now, Rachel, what did you think of this book? I liked it. I thought it was it was very entertaining. I think it was kind of like light and fluffy, even though it was like darker content. You know, it was like dark, gritty streets of like soot covered London. You know, it had very Sherlock and Watson like vibe to it, but it was very entertaining. Like it's not it, it's not a book that would change your life unless maybe maybe you didn't maybe you had a undiscovered love of 1800s london or sherlock holmes and then now your life has changed forever maybe but <laughs> no i really liked it i thought it was a well balanced book mm-hmm. you know i kind of use that term kind of punningly um, like a balanced breakfast <laughs> Kind of, yeah, but there was a lot of lightness and darkness to this book. So I think that the author actually really did a great job with balancing that light and dark. You know, it's not too like dark and grotesque, but there is moments of look. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But I, I don't know. I just I really enjoyed it. I really did. She did play with the concept of duality throughout very well yeah she did there was always a side another side to the coin yes absolutely i mean that that goes with saying with just his abilities but his personality as well um even some of the other characters you know like being the good voice or the bad voice you know there was it was very well balanced I love the fact that like I think he was like an unintentional bad boy because like everyone because of his darkness and the fact that the shadows follow him everyone in town is like not taking a bad they're kind of like um they have an aversion to him so when he walks in a room they like scatter they like go away they don't want to talk to him (laughs) but then his his maid and butler like adore him because he's a great guy um it was very it was very supernaturally if this guy existed i totally want to talk to him i don't know just the the whole like controlling the shadows around him and being able to pop in and out of situations like that it's so interesting like i I would want to get inside his brain like kind of see where the hell he's at in life because he's like a hermit you know he's like that eccentric wealthy hermit he 
lives in his house and has like his staff who he treats as friends or more like family, but he doesn't really talk to anyone. You know, every once in a while he'll talk to his butler, but it's almost like no one's there for him because they can't be because he's special. Yeah. He's the only one that's dealing with what he's with, with what he has going on. Right. And you know, the way that you say it like that, it kind of reminds me of the relationship between Batman and his butler. Oh, Michael Caine. Yes. So that that kind of like that vibe. Freaking treasure. I love Sir Michael Caine. I know you do. He did a great job. He really did. Yeah, in everything he's ever played ever. <laughs> Lord. Literally though, that's the kind of vibe that I I kind of see out of that. Like he's Mm -hmm. he's trying to be the hero while also living in the shadows but you know he's got all this money and he finally wants to help people and he has the ability to do it it's just like everybody just kind of looks at him in a different light so he doesn't want to do anything to stand out he wants to keep his secrets he wants to stay hidden so i mean he he has like a total disadvantage while also being advantaged it's so weird I think that my favorite part about his personality, other than his ability, well, his abilities aren't his personality, but his, my favorite thing about his personality is what guard the main character has for human life. Like his inspector friend or whatever is very jaded. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, that person's better off dead. Whereas Midnight it is very much, no, like this person has a name. They have a, they have a reason for being here. They're you know, every time the inspector gets kind of crass, Midnight's like, uh-uh, this is a person. <laughs> so listen, his relationship with Polly. Okay, real quick. Um, so as I had mentioned, there there was a string of victims that were left that were barely alive, but not quite dead. Polly is one of these victims. She's a little girl around six or seven years old. And when he sees her in the hospital, he immediately just has like this connection with her and wants nothing more than to help her. And the relationship that he has with her is just absolutely adorable. My heart, when he first got her to smile at at him, ugh. I'm like, oh my god, that's so cute. I'm like, <laughs> I nearly melted right there on the spot. Like, so adorable. But the fact that he had such a a need to make sure she was okay, to take care of her, to make sure that she wasn't just one of those people that were just better off dead. He wanted to make sure that her life was better than just being better dead you know and i love that about him and i said i think that spoke volumes about him as a person yeah absolutely it definitely it definitely speaks to his his values and morals and and you know i i was talking with one of our friends on threads a couple days ago and we were talking about unlikely friendships and mine i didn't put it on threads because i couldn't accurately describe it without it sounding like there's there's a there's a character limit you know and I didn't want to put it on there and not be able to fully explain myself because my favorite unlikely combination is like that rough and tumble you know the the man who kind of like an outcast or a loner or whatever sometimes he's like an adventurer sometimes he's just a killer sometimes he's whatever and he unexpectedly <laughs> becomes the guardian of a young girl. And I it not obviously not in a creepy way, not in a weird, like inappropriate way. But I think that there's just something so beautifully sweet about this like hard, rough and tumble man who now has to like take care of this little girl who likes picking flowers. And like, you know, he takes on that kind of patriarchal role. And kind of like 
kind of like Leon the professional. That was the first thing that popped in my well, head. Well, a hundred percent. And I never saw that movie as creepy, but a lot of people had a lot of problems with it because they said that it was creepy and inappropriate. You know, she had a crush on Leon and like whether or not she had a crush on him is irrelevant. Like if when I was a kid, I had crushes on older people, you know, but like if there was a line that was crossed, yeah, that would be iffy and sketchy, but I don't know. I know that Natalie Portman said that she had issue, you know, she took um, a little bit of umbrage with that movie in hindsight, but I don't know. I really loved it. <laughs> I just love that dynamic. I think it's so sweet. Like the little girl, like pulling that other side of this person who's hardened by life. Yeah. You know, I just love it. No, I, I absolutely understand that because I would have found it creepy if he would have responded to her advances but because he did not like that's why i I don't know i did i didn't have that sort of look at it but i i 100 percent agree with you it's like i hope your dad doesn't listen to this but your your (laughs) dad scares the shit out of me okay literally (laughs) in the most wholesome way listen i know he this man would never (laughs) hurt me but he Correct. is just so intimidating. It is not even funny. Okay. When you are six or seven years old and you look up at this big ass burly man staring down at you, you get terrified and you want to piss your pants. Okay. That's the first memory I have of this man. And it is forever embedded in my head. And that is forever how I will see her father. I'm really interested to see where this is going. But I know if I walk into that that house right now, he would fucking hug me. I know he would. Mm-hmm. And I have seen him holding a baby. And it is the cutest fucking thing ever. All right. But he is that man that like is all badass and everything. But if a little girl walks up to him with some flowers, he'll sit there and smile at her and take the flowers and it, it will be the cutest fucking thing I've ever seen in my mm-hmm. life. And I can't wait to see it with the baby. I know. Like, just him holding the baby is just... Mm. But he's still scary as fuck. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. Back to the book. <laughs> you weirdo. Your dad really terrifies me. <laughs> no. He terrified you. Yeah, true. <laughs> but I'm forever still that child in my brain. So, you know. (laughs) So what is your unlikely friendship or unlikely pairing? How about the gangbanger and the nice little housewife? You just like good girls. No, no. (laughs) I was thinking, oh, Elizabeth. Oh, Rio, man. (sighs) That I like. I like Rio. Whatever Rio is. Like, <laughs> Man, do we digress. <laughs> Sorry. Just him saying Elizabeth is just like playing in my head right now. I'm not loving it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, whatever whatever Rio is, I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so bad boy with the the goody two shoes girl. That. Gotcha. Was there a favorite quote for this week? You know, I I had, uh, yes, it says he felt such sorrow and shame that one human being could inflict such torment on another. Mm. And like, I don't know, it just hit me a certain type of way because I know that feeling. I'm sure that you know that fe- everyone knows that feeling of when you see something just so heinous that, you know, a news story or, or an article or something. And you're just like, how, how could someone do that to a person? You know? Absolutely. And it was just so explicitly stated, like he felt such sorrow and shame that one human being could inflict such torment on another. Yeah. Yeah. I do like that. What about you? Um, to be honest, I really didn't have a favorite phrase this week. <laughs> Not, I'm not gonna lie. Mm-hmm. There was different parts of the book that I absolutely adored. Yeah, but there wasn't something specific that caught my eye that said, "This is it." You know, this is it. <laughs> well, I mean, 
I, there's just <laughs> always that that feeling like I don't know how to describe it but when I read something and if I feel it like I'm like yes but nothing nothing really mm-hmm. gave me that like it was well written like don't get me wrong and I love the concept of the book I love different things of the book but not a single line <laughs> Yeah, no, I get that. You know what this book felt like to me? It felt like the Robert Downey Jr. version of Sherlock. Like, whereas whereas Benedict's version will suck me in and I'll it, I'll just be like, you know, I'll just lose time watching it. Robert Downey Jr.'s version was was fun and, and it was enjoyable to watch, you know. But I don't know, it's it's a book that I would want to read if I was just like, you know, hanging out. There was nothing. I wasn't trying to have an existential like thought or anything. Right. Honestly, I think one of my favorite parts of this book was actually the very beginning, besides like his interaction with Mm -hmm. Polly, when he was actually being born because of the fact that you could tell how much his father absolutely adored his mother. Mm -hmm. The love between those two shown through those pages, like nothing I've ever read. Like, even if it was just, like, a brief couple of pages, I, I like, I was like, oh, my God. They, they like, really love each other. Like, he really loves her. Yeah. And, oh, that right there, like, kind of just, like, I don't know. It, it made me, like, appreciate her writing because of the fact that she was able to do it in so little pages and so few words that it was just, it was really great. Yeah, I actually really liked this prologue. Normally I don't like prologues, but this one was really, it was gripping. I I have a thing where like, I know a lot of people love it or like it when the book starts out slow and then you get thrown into the act. I'm not that person. Normally to me, like you could take out the first chapter and then we can start from chapter two and then I'll be hooked. You know, it'll just suck me in. But I liked this prologue because a lot was happening and you you got to see like where he came from where where midnight came from and all of that i i I like that you know what else you know what i loved what this book was centered around spring-heeled jack and so spring-heeled jack for those who don't know he was an english like urban legend um from the 1800s and he was kind of like the british version well in my head i i actually got the jersey devil and spring jack mixed up all the time so he was kind of i guess you could say like the english version of the jersey devil they were both from the 1800s both had horn there are there are accounts of them both being seen with horns with wings um stuff like that there's kind of I I believe I saw that there are thoughts that he was a doctor kind of the same as like Jack the Ripper that there are thoughts that he could have been a doctor but I thought that was really cool because it was I don't I've never really as far as I'm aware come across another book that was centered on Spring Hill Jack and I know that London specifically has a ton of weird urban legends like I can't remember what the other book that we were talking about where it was like the bus there was a bunch of them I don't remember but anyway yeah this is the first time that I read about spring Jack in the wild okay so listen I never heard of spring Jack until I read this book really so I had no idea yeah like a Jack the Ripper I knew about yeah spring Jack no not a clue so i used to when i was little um i've i've god i've read forever but my uncle especially used to love giving me creepy things like we would read scary stories like i'm talking like seven eight year old rachel (laughs) we would read the scary stories to tell in the dark books and we would watch scary movies and all this stuff and he gave me a book and it was a weird little i i don't even know if i still have it i i hope i can find it somewhere but it was a little book about monsters and it was like I can't remember what the name of it was, but it was a book about mo- like monsters and both mm-hmm. spring Jack and the Jersey devil were in there. And I think they were side by side. And I think that's why I always got them mixed up. Okay. Huh? <laughs> well, that, that would make sense though, that you would get a mix up like that. I just, 
I am naive and have lived in a hole my whole life. You're such a nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, I do love to expand my knowledge, but when it comes to things like that, I'm not like fully aware of them. So I don't know. It's just. I'm a whore for knowledge. I want to know anything and everything. Give me all your stuff, especially like, like, folklore or urban legends or like customs different cultures and see i was more of the let me learn all of the psychological fucking problems with the world like you want to know about freaking borderline personality disorder i got you i wrote a fucking 10 page paper about it in college you you want to know about freaking adhd or freaking uh bipolar well i i've got my family to work on so i understand (laughs) (laughs) so like that's where i went down the rabbit holes i i took every freaking psychology class that you could think of i wanted all the knowledge about the brain Mm -hmm. but you wanted all the knowledge about the mythological world and i respect that well not even just mythological just like like customs wedding traditions or funeral traditions oof um yeah just all of the stuff yeah just put me on a boat let me go around to everywhere (laughs) i respect it i respect it we just had two different alleys of knowledge that we wanted to go down yeah that's all no absolutely it's cool too because like if i ever have any questions on one thing i can ask you and if you need anything you just got me exactly it's like our two brains you know separated are are awesome but then we put them together and we're like fucking mega women that's why I was gonna say I was gonna say mega man but (laughs) I thought you were gonna say mega mind and I was gonna be like (laughs) spider no that's why I whenever you say that I'm the quote-unquote smart one I want to punch you in the throat we're just you are educated in different ways than I am and yeah like you you have different knowledge base like like that actually works for this fucking world and me I'm like you need to know how to do like crack an engine in a car. I got you. Oh, you need me to change your brakes. I got you there. You need me to fucking break into your house. I got you there. But you know, <laughs> I just, I know different things about different things and you know, things that are, you know, a little bit more important. <laughs> I don't think so because your, your knowledge is way more practical than mine. Yeah. But practical is like, it, it all depends. Like it all depends. Uh, yeah. I could have freaking, I could have killed you when you hadn't put oil in your car for fucking however long. <laughs> What's <it had> oil? <laughs> uh, yeah, like literally, I would be the one to fucking do it if I lived there. But now I know her dad's got her and her brother's got her, so I like that worry is off my chest. But in fact, I still haven't gotten an oil change. <laughs> Woman, <laughs> do you need me to come it's down been, like, there? Two fucking- years. <laughs> okay, listen. <laughs> Listen, your fucking oil is probably sludge. Oh no. my god, you're gonna you're gonna fucking go get an oil change, and they're gonna be like, "Oh, sorry, your fucking engine seized because all the fucking oil, old oil was keeping it going." At that point, <laughs> no, I'm a modern marvel. <laughs> like literally, I could go change my oil in my car now. It's just fucking twelve degrees out. There's no way. <laughs> so I need an oil change, but no, uh. Uh-uh. uh no thank you anyway anyways yes so i don't know how we got this far off topic but we did you know what that's fine um i did notice there was a spot where there was a weird instance of head hopping and you you'll you'll know it when i say it so there's a character who was drugged and then another character is taking advantage of that character in their drugged state then yes it was like so when person a was was conscious then it was in their it was in their head and then when that person passes out then all of a sudden we're in the other person's head the one who's doing the assaulting and then when person a wakes back up we're back in their head and i was like well that was freaking weird (laughs) Mm. Honestly, I really love that part because it was it was gross. It was gross what she wanted to do to to midnight. <laughs> um, 
especially in the state he was in. But then he woke up and then that was gross. And I'm not going to spoil that for anybody because it was gross and you need to read it. But it was like, oh, yes, payback, you know? So I like that part. Don't ask me why. Maybe it was because of the role reversal. Like, hello, Cardi B. But <laughs> oh, I can't even believe you said that name. Ugh. Sorry. It's a heinous thing for anyone to do. To anyone. Yeah, it is. It is. But we digress. <laughs> so, Jen, out of all of the characters in the book, who would you say was your favorite? Okay, so I kind of had two. So okay. the obvious one is Midnight, obviously. Um, okay. <laughs> but, like I said, his his character was well balanced. Uh, I love the fact that he struggled so much with his humanity. Like he he didn't want to hurt people. He didn't want everybody to look at him as a bad guy he wanted to be in the shadows but he didn't want to be a bad guy just because he was out of the picture and in the shadows you know i love Mm -hmm. that about him but okay this is gonna be a weird one i love the nanny this is p oh claire uh what was it uh clementine clementine i started singing it in my head (laughs) And she was so cute. Like, I don't, oh, she was like that, that mom character, but, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, she was like, oh, hello, my little poppet. And I was like, oh my God. Like, I just wanted to squeeze her. (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. There was a part in the book where, um, no, I I can't, I can't, no spoilers. I'm sorry. I was going to say something really cute, but no spoilers. Yeah, I agree. She but, was that that very, you know, motherly figure. Yeah, and I'm sorry, when she said, hello, puppet, it, it reminded me of Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm not gonna lie. He was also very motherly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he kind of was. Hello, puppet. Ah, oh, I love that. I'm oh sorry. <laughs> no, I like that. I, I, I'm I glad that she, I, and I agree, she was, she was a very... I just love the fact that they took care of him. It was it was the Batman effect. You know what I mean? Like he didn't have anyone, but like I love it when people like you have those people who treat their staff as just staff, and it's like fine. You have those people who treat their staff poorly. And then you have those people that treat their staff like family. And like, man, I get it, dude. I get it. And I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it was, I don't know. It, even her role wasn't even like that crucial in the book, but she just stood out to me. And I mm-hmm. it, that's all it took. <laughs> I love but it. Who was who was your favorite? Okay. So again, ignoring the fact that Midnight exists, right? Okay. My favorite was Polly. <laughs> okay yeah i could see it i loved her so so there was one part because she was just fine right like she was fine so poor polly had a severed right hand her right hand was gone one of her hands one of her whole hands was missing right and he's talking to her and she says instead of like instead of like shake on it she said bump she says bump stumps on it and I thought it was the cutest little thing and it was like the first time when we really start to see her like really sassy personality because she she is very sassy and it was just a bump stumps on it I was dead (laughs) she really was so cute I like I loved her feistiness and in the book I mean just the fact that she was like don't take this the wrong way she was like that gutter child so yeah she was like at the beginning of my fair lady yeah so i mean she she didn't speak proper english she couldn't tell time like she was very uneducated and to the streets like she was she was a uh a street rat for lack of better terms (laughs) street (laughs) urchin yes so i mean it, it was just like it was great to see her come out of her shell and really like kind of show that she had life in her, you know, mm-hmm. even though she had such a tragic start of her life, she 
she really showed promise. So I love that. Yeah, there's a part where he gives her something to read and she's like, what? What does it say? I can't read anything on there. No, Ken. <laughs> that was not a direct quote, but it was just it was cute. Oh, God. Yeah, she was she was spicy. I loved it. <laughs> there. So the characters in this book, they were all it's hard to pick a favorite because they were all generally likable. Like he, like the main character was likable. His, his Butler and his maid were likable. The inspector guy at the characters, there was a very strong sense of, of right and wrong of good guy, bad guy. There weren't a lot of like complexities in the characters, but not in a bad way. Not meaning that it's kind of like a, well, they're just one dimensional. No, it was just kind of like, like Superman, you know, like there's, there's good guys, there's bad guys, there's right, there's wrong. Even Midnight, who is what he is. And like Jen said before, you know, he very much did not want to be a bad guy, which makes all the difference. I think one of the biggest thing is, is it, although they weren't complex characters, they didn't need to be like mm-hmm. their dynamics were perfect. Exactly how they were. Like if they would have been more complex, it would have taken away from their part of the story. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what kind of gave this book a little bit of, of footing, you know, it, it's like, you didn't need to be overly complicated. She didn't over explain. Oh my God. I love the fact that she didn't over explain everything or uh, she, she left details to the mind and those mm-hmm. details that she didn't want to, to just automatically kind of come up with. She told you and ooh, she told, Oh, Miss Mary's scene is just like, <laughs> Oh, gross. That, that scene is going to live in my brain rent free for a little while. <laughs> Not in a good way. Not in a good way, no. No, she very much did. And I think that might be what I mean when I say that this was a light, it was a light kind of feel. It was an entertaining read. It wasn't like a, you know, a, a deep, complex read because she didn't. She left so much up to your brain. Even to the point of like what people looked like. You have no idea what what Midnight looks like. The only thing that you know for sure is there are maybe two instances where she says handsome face or something, something adjacent to that. But it just she gives you she gives you the story and then lets your brain fill in the rest, which if she were to make the characters more complex or if she were to fill in more of those blanks, it would have made the story different from what it was or from what it is right it so it might not be an agatha christie it might not be a sherlock holmes but it's its own entity and i think that it made it kind of stand out because of that i don't know Mm -hmm. i i actually want to read the other books in the series because of the way that she wrote this it doesn't it didn't need to be complicated but it was great Mm -hmm. yeah so this is the first book in a series and i believe there are four books in the series yeah i don't know i just i don't know i I liked it i thought it was cute and entertaining and fun honestly i want to see what she does with book two like i'm interested to see how it would like how the series is gonna turn so Mm -hmm. i'm definitely gonna look into it more as we said this book was written by the award-winning author C. L. Monahan, it is the f- it is the first in the Midnight Gun series. The author lives in Fife in the UK, and you can learn all about her at clmonahan.com. That's C. L. M. O. N. A. G. H. A. N. dot com. On her website, there are links to her social media pages, to her fan group. She also has a paranormal romance duality um and the first one is imaginario and the other one i can't remember but <laughs> it looks cute there's some there the little blurb said something about like the most dreamy like italian book boyfriend i was like sign me up for that oh, that sounds pretty friggin yeah up our alley <laughs> <laughs> right up our alley um Yeah, so if you want to hear more or want to to learn more about the author, just go ahead and check her out. 
<laughs> Honestly, she's so adorable. The yeah. author? She, she lived in <laughs> Africa. That's awesome. Now I have Toto stuck in my head. No, she does. I was reading a little bit more about like about her and, and everything. And um, yeah, she seems pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, on her biography, it says she lived in South Africa, a land of adventure and cheetah kisses. And that's just adorable. I love that. <laughs> I want cheetah kisses. I want cheetah kisses too. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, honestly, I highly recommend checking out this book. And I, I already said I'm going to check out the next in the series as well. And maybe mm-hmm. I'll even check out uh, Imaginario. We'll see. I like Italian men. You know? Right? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we all know I love Italian men. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're ready for this, folks. But I certainly am. Because I have been begging and begging and you know harassing rachel for months months like six months literally (laughs) for this next book so next week we are reading gothicana by runix yay literally like okay you didn't even have to twist my arm too hard though because as soon as i read beauty and the beast meets dracula my whole i got the chills (laughs) like listen I did. I knew I didn't have to twist your arm for that, but at the same time, it was like she wouldn't give me a fucking answer. So uh, literally, I'm like, "Can we do this? Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it?" I felt like <laughs> Stewie in Family Guy when sh- he's like, "Ma, Mom, ma, 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 mommy, <laughs> ma, ma, ma." Like literally, <laughs> that's what I was doing to just get this book. I'm like, "I need to read this, and I need the pretty copy." So. Not only do I have the pretty copy, but I'm going to read it. Ah! So. <laughs> yeah, so I I'm actually really excited about this book too because like okay, I am really here for a nice hardcover. Like I am the epitome of hardcover book lover. I would buy anything in a hardcover. Um, but I don't have like a, any special editions, and like of course we all know that special editions are the hot ticket right now. Why? Because they're st- stunning and i don't have any not a single one nothing with sprayed edges i don't have any beautiful books like i'm they're, just kidding that's blasphemy they're all beautiful they're all stunning i was gonna say but i don't have any like you know quote unquote special editions <laughs> yes quote unquote. even i have one that which is why it's so surprising that you don't have one because well do you which book um it's the second book for fourth wing oh yeah so i got the sprayed edge book i was so excited Ooh, it's just black but i mean even still it's still pretty i love it but i am like beyond excited for this one because it's it's just gorgeous and i'm i'm going to say this i i'm gonna say a hot thing Mm -hmm. If I liked Akatar, I would have bought the special edition that I sent you because oh um, yeah, it was glitter. It was glittered, okay? It was gorgeous. Black and glitter and just oh. Yeah. Mm. But I didn't like it, so I won't buy it. I won't nope. That book will never sit on my shelf. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I feel that. I want like I love I love PR boxes. I love the special edition books. I just, I'm not in a place at the moment in my life to be able to do that. But, man, let me tell you, I'm really excited about about Gothicana. Oh, God, yeah. So, so I guess just like, subscribe, follow us. We're on now YouTube because we're awesome like that. And we are on youtube i can't believe we're on youtube it's so weird (laughs) but we also open submissions for books guys so if there's something that you want us to read or if you have your own book that you would like us to review submit it 
Yes. I know that I already have a list of books that I'm going to read on my own. And then we've already started compiling a list of books for the podcast. Yes. I'm so excited. We're not giving away any (laughs) hints on what books were decided upon and which ones are going to be personal reads. No, no spoilers. We're not big on spoilers here. (laughs) We try. Uh, Yeah, we do try. Sometimes we don't succeed. Okay, everybody. We shall see you next week. Bye. Bye.